A large number of Muslimin are counted as such in the records, yet they do not even uphold one of these five pillars of creed, horizons, fasting, charity, and pilgrimage. And official papers and the counting that will be recorded as Muslimin, whereas in Allah's records, they can hardly be counted as such. And it even is extended to the point where the CIA includes what? A lot of people that you wouldn't consider Muslim. Because they commit they commit shirk. They have abandoned their prayers. Um, yet, you know. Ibn Abbas relates a hadith stating that Islam is based on three principles. Faith, salah, and fasting. You know, the... Uh, the Ritual prayers and fasting. Whoever fails to uphold any one of these is a disbeliever and deserves capital punishment. Well, there's further context to that is that certain people were pardoned on a conditional basis, wars were stopped, that sort of thing, and then, you know. But people who apostatize on their own, there's plenty of examples of the prophet. Well, uh, there are examples of what happened with the prophet that um, no one was punished for apostasy. They were criticized, perhaps, but, you know. As regards to the latter portion of this hadith, the ulama stated that they only become disbelievers when, together with failing, to uphold any principle, they also deny its necessity or its being a principle. No matter what meaning is given, the fact remains that Rasulullah most strongly spoke out against such people and those who fail to keep the obligatory practices. Harad of Deen, you know, the system of judgment, should indeed fear Allah's anger greatly. The pleasures of life are short-lived, and death will surely bring them face to face with Allah. There, none can escape, and only obedience to his commands in this world can save us. There are only those ignorant persons who do not fast, but much worse is the case of those who not only refuse to fast, but they make fun of the month of fasting, saying in a sarcastic manner, he should fast who has no foods in his house, or what does Allah gain by having us suffer hunger? Now, suffering, suffering is a personal choice. Going through difficulty, that's that's not the same thing as suffering, now is it? Um, but we're not supposed to even lie in sarcasm. Because look at the three stages of that break down the ability of the brain to help us control things is the swearing, the lying, the drug use. This is why we don't do these things in Islam. Well, we don't do them because of them themselves, but you know. Such words should never be uttered. It can be remembered that to make fun of the smartest part of our deen can lead to goofer, apostasy. Should any person perform not a single salah in his life, or fast one single day, or fail to perform any fard obligations at Islam, he does not become a kafir, provided he does not deny these being necessary. Whatever fard obligation he has been has been performed is rewarded, and whatever fard has not been performed shall be punished. But to make fun of even the smallest part of the deen can lead to kufr, apostasy. That's not quite the word of, for apostasy, but it's covering the truth or disbelief. Um, as a result of which, all good actions are lost. From this, it can be seen how dangerous each scoffing is. So, we should be aware of any dishonorable words about fasting. Even otherwise, anyone failing to fast in Ramadan without a valid excuse becomes a transgressor. Fasik. Some fukaha jurists have gone so far as the state that anyone eating publicly in Ramadan without a valid excuse should be put to death. 
you know, because they like to invent punishments for stuff that uh, Muhammad never actually had punishments for. Just like the whole apostasy thing. Well, they weren't killed for being apostates. It was known that they had turned against other agreements. This was just part of it. Um, even in the absence of an Islamic government to enforce this law, and thus put an end to these actions, nothing stops us from expressing our dislike, resentment, and hatred against such actions. Hate the evil, hate the ignorance, but not the uh, individual, perhaps. That is the least to which our Iman faith should drive us, and the minimum level of faith is to consider such actions bad at heart. Having come so far, I consider these ten ahadith sufficient in the first chapter, for those who wish to follow them sincerely, as for those who have no intention to change their actions accordingly, no amount of writing will be useful. May Allah grant me and the Muslimin the strength to do righteous deeds, because we all have our failings. Amin. You know, maybe so. Chapter 2. Laylat al qadr The Night of Power. Amongst the nights of Ramadan, there is one called Laylat al qadr a night it is noted for its great barakah, blessing. The Quran describes it as being greater in barakah and spiritual value than the thousand months, which, of course, means that it is more valuable than 83 years and four months. Unfortunately, uh, Okay, I've read out of order here. Um, fortunate indeed. Fortunate indeed is that person who attains full baraka of this night by spending it in the worship of Allah, because he has then obtained the reward of the Bada worship for 83 years, four months, and even more. Indeed, the granting of this night for the faithful Muslimin is a great honor. The origin. Regarding this night in a hadith reported by Anas in Al Dur Al Mantur, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is reported to have said, Layla Qadr was granted to this Ummah of mine, and not to any other Ummah before this. As regarded the reason for the granting of Layla Qadr, various views are held. According to some a hadith, one reason is given thus. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to ponder over the longer lives of peoples of the past ages, and when comparing them with the much shorter lives of his ummah, you know, community, he became very sad since. If his ummah wished to complete, uh, to compete with the people before then, because of their shorter lives, it would be impossible for them to either copy or surpass the previous nations in the doing of righteous deeds. Now, whether a person accepts Muhammad as the seal of the exemplar prophets, the last of the messenger prophets of God, um, doesn't matter. We're referring to his ummah is everybody since he's been called to be a prophet. Um, Therefore, Allah, in his infinite Rahmah, granted them this night of great blessings. This means that if any fortunate person of this Ummah during his lifetime spends ten such nights in the worship of his Creator, he would have gained the reward of the Bada worship for 833 years and even more. Another report said, states that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once related to the Sahaba the story of a very righteous man from the Bani Israel who spent 1,000 months in jihad. I'm not sure whether they mean striving, which you could make a lifetime about that, whether you're physically able 
do hard effort or not. Um, on hearing this, the Sahaba felt that they could not attain the same reward, whereupon Allah granted them this night. Still, another report states that it so happened that our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once mentioned the names of the four Anbiya from among the many Israel, each of whom spent 80 years in Allah's sincere worship and not disobeying in the least. They were Nabi Ayyub, you know, Joe, Alayhi Salam, Zechariah, Alayhi Salam, you know, Zechariah, Bill Kiffel, Alayhi Salam, you know, Ezekiel, Yusha, Alayhi you Salam, know, Joshua. The Sahaba heard this, you know, the companions, wondering how to copy their achievements. Ben Jabra'il alayhi salam appeared and recited Surah Qadr, wherein the Fadda'il of, you know, the virtue of this particular night were revealed. But there are other reports too, explaining the origin of the night of power. But no matter which of these we accept, the important fact remains that Allah has granted us this night as a favor, and how fortunate are those spiritual people who we have never missed worship in this night. As to which particular night it is, here again approximately 50 different views are reported. It is not easy for me to enumerate them all. But the most generally accepted versions follow in the following pages of this chapter. Because Ron Majid itself mentions the night. We shall commence with a short commentary, the Surah Qadr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna anzamhu fi laylatu Qadr. In the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we have indeed revealed this in the Night of Power. And by this, you know, the message, the revealed scripture, the Quran. Um, so Surah 97, is that 97? 97, yeah. Reference here is made to the fact that on the specific night, the Quran was sent down from Allah al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet, to the lower heavens above the earth. The mere fact that the Quran was revealed on this night would have been sufficient to ensure its greatness. But apart from from this fact, it is also noted for many other things. In the very next verse, by way of increasing our interest in the matter under discussion, a question is asked. And what will explain to you what the Night of Power is? Surah 97, A at 2. In other words, the question here asked here is, have you any knowledge as to the greatness and importance of this night? Have you any knowledge as to the favors and bounties that go with it? The next verse proceeds to explain its greatness. <laughs> night of power is better than a thousand months. Surah 97, 8, 3. The true meaning here is that the reward for suspending this night in worship of the Da is better and more than having spent 1,000 months in worship at Bada. But we are not told here as to how much more rewarding it is. I've messed up. Therein come down, ye light beings and the spirit, with God's permission, on every Aaron. Well, with its Lord's permission, but yeah, by the Lord, we mean God. Um, so, Sir 97, A at 4, a fine explanation is given for this 
verse by Imam al-Razi, Rahmat alayhi. Commenting on this verse, he explains that when man first appeared on earth, the Malaika, you know, the unfallen angels, looked upon him with concern. They even ventured to ask Allah, Who will you place on this earth? One who shall be righteous therein and shed blood? Similarly, when his parents noted his original form as a mere drop of sperm, and, you know, the feminine substance, they too looked upon it with dislike, so much so that they considered it as something which dirtied the clothes and had to be washed away. But latter, when Allah made that same sperm into the form of a child, you know, by means of its mother, they began to love and treasure him. So far have things now progressed that, but on this night of power we find the same man worshipping Allah and praising him than those very angels, you know, the lightnings, the malaika, came toward him, obviously repentant for the very thoughts they once had. Well, look what the other animals do, so. Waruhu. Waruh. And the spirit is a reference to Jibra'il. You know, Gabriel. Ohu. Mana. Um, but whichever name you have for that. Garoda, maybe. Um, who descend to the earth during this night. The fasters of the Quran have given various meanings to this word. Let's take a look at some of them. A. The vast majority of Musafirs are agreed that Jibra'il, alayhi islam, is meant here. And according to Imam al-Razi, this is the most correct meaning. Allah first makes mention of the Malaika, and then, because of Jibra'il, alayhi islam's special status among them, a separate mention is made of him. Some Mufasirs, Mufasirin, is that how you say it? Hold this view. Uh, hold the view that spirit here means one specific angel, Malik, of such extraordinary and gigantic proportions that before him the heavens and the earth appear as small as a morsel. Another group of Mufasirin say that the spirit here means one group of Malaika who, have never, who never ordinarily appear. And only on this night, it can be seen by other Malacca. Some commentators believe that spirit here designates one specific creation of Allah, who partake of food and drink, and yet are neither men nor Malacca. Are they tying this to the Fravashi doctrine, the Zoroastrians? Um, there's also a view that spirit here refers to the Nabi, Isa, alayhi salam, who on this night come down comes down to look at the righteous deeds of this Ummah. Or, you know, some people say that he's in suspension, but wakes up for a moment or something. Um, oh, okay. Um, F. Uh, the last interpretation we wish to mention here is that spirit means Allah's special mercy which comes behind the angel's descent. Now, we could say a seventh that is typically listed is we have the nafs, we have the anasima, we have the ruh. So the ruh is the spirit. And then there's the hay and um the wahidi is this is that the no actually I don't think there's the that fifth listen, but uh, I guess some systems of scholars say that. But the seventh here we say the the spirit, your own spirit, you know. There are other interpretations also, but as already stated, the first opinion given above is the best known. In this connection, Imam de Haqti relates a hadith by Anas, wherein Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, On Laylatul Qadr, Jibra'il comes down with a group of angels, Malaika, and prays for Rahmah. Bless, mercy at every uh, for everyone who they find busy in worship. Abada. The same verse under discussion mentions. Bidneramun 
by God's permission, come down on earth for blessed tasks. Surah 97, Ayat 4. The author of Mathahire Haq writes that on this night, ages ago, the Malaika were created long before the creation of Adam, alayhi salam, was begun in the shape of some matter on the same night. Jannah was planted with trees and numerous a hadith bear witness to the fact on the night on this night prayers are accepted similarly we read in the book al durr al mandur that according to a hadith it was on this night that nabi isa alayhi salam was lifted up bodily into the heaven and it was also said on that night that the repentance tauba of bani israel was accepted salamun hiya hatta ma Lal Dajr. Peace reigns until the break of dawn. And Surah 97 5. Indeed, this night is full of peace. Throughout its duration, the Malaika offer salutations to the faithful believers. As one group goes up, another comes down, with the same greeting as indicated in some narrations. Another interpretation is that. It is a night of complete safety from all evil and mischief. These barakat last all night into the break of dawn and are not limited to any one part of the night. And now having noted a, fervi a few virtues of this night, as explained in the words of Allah, we now turn to the hadith where we read more about the virtues of that night. Hadith 1. All sins are forgiven on the worshiping during this night. An Abi Hurayrata Radilahu Anhu Kala Kala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallama Man Kama Laylatul Qadr Imanan Ehtesaban Gufira Lahu Mata Kadama Men Vindhe Bukhari and Muslim narrate this. Abu Huraira, God be pleased with him, reports that the messenger of God, divine contact upon him in wholeness, said, Whosoever stands on the night of power with complete faith and with sincere hope of gaining reward, all his previous sins are forgiven. Note, in the above hadith, standing refers to salah, but includes any other form of of Ibada, for example, Fikr, Talawa, etc. The phrase with sincere hope of getting reward means that one's intention should be pure and one should stand before Allah in great humility and sincerity. According to Al Qatabi, it means that one should have complete faith in the promise that deeds shall be rewarded and should not have the idea that this form of Ibada is a burden, nor should he have any doubts as to whether. The promised reward shall be great, granted. After all, it is a known fact that when one aims high and desires a great reward, while at the same time having complete certainty of receiving it, the task of striving hard in prayers to attain that goal becomes easy. This is the reason why those who have become spiritually elevated in Allah's sight find it easy to remain in Epidah almost at all times. It will be noted that where the hadith speaks about previous sins being forgiven, the ulama have stated that this forgiveness, as mentioned above in the hadith and in others, refers only to minor sins, because as indicated in the Quran, the major sins can only be forgiven after sincere repentance, with a vow to never commit such sins again. So whenever a hadith states that the sins are forgiven, the ulama take it to imply minor sins. My late father, may Allah bless him and grant Light, in his resting place, used to say that for two reasons the word minor has been omitted in the ahadith. First, he says, a true Muslim is one on whom no major sin should remain, because whenever a major sin has been committed by him, he will never rest or find peace until he has sin sincerely repented to his sustainer. Secondly, during such great and blessed days and nights, when a true Muslim stands before his sustainer in prayers and adoration, Hoping to gain reward, 
than he in his conscience feels grieved for his previous sins, which, together with the resolution not to return to such deeds, are the most important requirements of Tauba, seeking forgiveness. This means that on such days and nights, the worshiper indeed repents for major sins that have been committed by him, leaving only minor sins to be forgiven. At its best, however, when a night like, like, a night like Layla Tolkater comes along, one should first of all repent verbally with his heart full of sincere longing for forgiveness, so that Allah and his infinite Rahmah may forgive all forms of sin. And when you do this, remember me too in your prayers.